Before we break, let's quickly go through uh, the first, maybe even the second question. Number one, are there echoes or connections between the details of the case and the solution? A number of groups took this question, and there are, in fact, some echoes. The main echo is that the way the letter was stolen is very similar to the way that Dupont recovered the letter. Um, let's see if we can find this. So this is how the letter was stolen. This is on page 20. Uh, here, the document in question, a letter to be frank, had been received by the personage, the, the queen, robbed while alone in the royal boudoir, so she was alone in her bedroom. During its perusal, so while she was reading the letter, she was suddenly interrupted by the entrance of the other exalted personage, so the other person. Uh, we later learn that the other person is Minister D. Um, and the queen did not want him to see the letter. So a hurried and vain, which means useless, endeavor, which means effort, to thrust it in a drawer, she was forced to place it open as it was upon a table. This is a very interesting scene. So she sees Minister D enter, and he's just coming in, so he doesn't know what's going on. She sees him enter. She tries to put the letter in the drawer of her table, but she's too slow. So she has to pretend like there's nothing special going on. So she has to leave the letter open on the table. This first act of pretending, pretending like nothing special about the letter, will come back later in this story. Continuing, the address, however, was uppermost. So at the top of the letter was the address. And the contents thus unexposed, the letter escaped notice. So the letter is not completely open. It's like uh, usually we fold a letter into three parts. And so the, the bottom two parts are folded. Only the address is visible. And therefore, Minister D, uh, or sorry, the contents of the letter were not open to read. However, at this juncture, which means at this moment, enters the Minister D. His lynx eye, sorry, so the exalted personage is not Minister D. This is the king. The other person that should not read this letter. So in comes Minister D. His lynx eye, a lynx is like a, a one of those wild cats, right? A big wild cat. What is this one? Bauma. Something like that. So in other words, a very sharp eye. Immediately perceives the paper, recognizes the handwriting of the address, observes the confusion of the personage addressed, and fathoms her secret. This guy is very smart. He walks in, he looks at the table, he sees the address, he knows who lives there, he knows the handwriting of the person, so he knows who wrote the letter. And then he sees that the queen is very confused. Confused here just means like in a panic, uh, not settled. And he puts these two ideas together and he realizes what is in the letter. Very smart guy. Let's take a short break.
the queen receives a letter from her lover. The king walks in too fast for her to hide the letter, but he doesn't notice. But Minister D walks in, sees the letter, and knows exactly what's going on. After some business transactions, hurried through in his ordinary manner, so you know, he came for a reason, so he deals with the reason. He produces a letter. Produce here means take out. He takes out a letter somewhat similar to the one in question. OK, so he just happens to have a letter that looks like the queen's lover's letter. OK. Opens it, pretends to read it, and then places it in close juxtaposition to the other. So he puts his letter on the queen's table near the a very important letter. Again, he converses, which means talks, for some 15 minutes upon the public affairs. At length in taking leave, so when he leaves, he takes also from the table the letter to which he had no claim. So he puts down his letter, talks for about 15 minutes, and when he leaves, he picks up the queen's letter. Its rightful owner, the queen, saw, but of course dared not call attention to the act in the presence of the king. So she can't say, hey, that's my letter, because the king is there. And the king will ask, oh, you got a letter? Who is it from? What's it about? And she doesn't want to let him know. The minister decamped, which means left, leaving his own letter, one of no importance, upon the table. So this is how Minister D gets the letter. Everything happens in plain sight. Everyone sees what's going on, but only two people know what it means. So uh, this is echoed in the conclusion of how Dupont got the letter back. Near the end of the story. Uh, let's see. Uh, by the way, the group in the back, mathematicians here. And algebra, uh, Dai Shu. So the story does mention math. We'll talk about that in question six. Uh, let's see, where is it? Okay, so this is page 28. In the middle of this really long paragraph. He must have foreseen. Foreseen means predict. He must have foreseen, I reflected, the secret investigations of his premises, so he knew the police would search his house. His frequent absences from home at night, which were hailed by the prefect as certain aids to his success, I regarded only as ruses, pianju, to afford opportunity for thorough search to the police, and thus the sooner to impress them with the conviction to which G, in fact, did finally arrive, the conviction or belief that the letter was not upon the premises. So D wanted the police to keep searching his house so that the police would believe that the letter was not in the house. And so, of course, the letter must be in the house. So where is it? Uh, OK, yes, so page 29. But the more I reflected upon the daring, dashing and discriminating ingenuity of D, so the more I thought about how smart this guy is. 
upon the fact that the document must always have been at hand if he intended to use it to good purpose. It's blackmail, hey Han. So he could need it at any moment. And upon the decisive evidence of, obtained by the prefect, it was not hidden within the limits of that dignitary's ordinary search. So it's not hidden in any secret place. The more satisfied I became that to conceal this letter, the minister had resorted to the comprehensive and sagacious, which means wise, expedient, which means way, of not attempting to conceal it at all. So because of this whole situation, Dupont believes on, there's only one conclusion. Minister D did not hide the letter. So Dupont sneaks into Minister D's house un, under a disguise, and he, uh, two paragraphs from the bottom. Okay, sorry, last paragraph. At length, my eyes in going the circuit of the room, which means going around the room, fell upon a trumpery filigree card rack of pasteboard. So a fancy looking card rack that hung dangling by a dirty blue riband. Riband just means ribbon. From a little brass knob just beneath the middle of the mantelpiece, the mantel is the shelf above the fireplace. In this rack, which had three or four compartments, were five or six visiting cards. What's a visiting card? Do you guys know what a visiting card is? Okay, so imagine that you are living in the 19th century. Imagine you are a 19th century gentleman. And you want to go visit a friend of yours. How would you go? Would you just call your servant, call your horse and ride over? No, you first send your servant to tell your friend that you will be coming. Because there's no telephone. And how does your friend know that this is your servant? Your servant will have your card and will give your card to your friend and tell your friend that you will be coming at a specific time. That is a visiting card. Uh, it's not an invitation. It's telling you I will be coming soon. So it's the opposite of an invitation. Another name for this is a calling card because it tells the person you will be calling on them, which means visit. Right, so some visiting cards and a solitary letter. Aha. This last was much soiled and crumpled, so it's dirty and it has been crumpled up before. It was torn nearly in two across the middle. So it's almost torn in half. As if a design in the uh, design here means intention as if a design in the first instance to tear it entirely up as worthless had been altered or stayed in the second. So it's almost torn in half as if the reader thought it's worthless, I should throw it away, but at the last moment changed his mind. I don't know, to me it seems a little too obvious. You didn't take her. It had a large black seal bearing the D cipher very conspicuously, right? So Dupont also thinks that this is maybe too obvious. It's very conspicuous. Conspicuous means obvious. OK, so what does this mean? A large black seal bearing the D cipher. OK, imagine you are a 19th century gentleman and you want to send a letter to your friend. At this moment, there are no stamps. So how do you tell the postman or your messenger or your friend that this is an important letter and it is private? You take a candle. You light the candle and you drip some wax 
onto the opening of the letter after you fold it, right? Then you take your personal stamp, Zhang, and you stamp your mark into the wax. This tells people the letter is from you and you yourself wrote it. And it also tells people not to try to open the letter because if you open the letter, you will break the wax. So this is the seal, Zhang. And the cipher is the symbol. The D cipher is the symbol that belongs to Minister D. Very conspicuously. And was addressed in a diminutive female hand to D, the minister himself. It was thrust carelessly and even as it seemed, contemptuously into one of the uppermost divisions of the rack. No sooner had I glanced at this letter than I concluded it to be that of which I was in search. So Dupont sees the letter and he thinks, aha, that's the one I want. Uh, and then he tells, he goes on to tell us how different it is from the letter that he wants. But then the radicalness of these differences, which was excessive. So basically this is saying it's so different that it was obviously made to look different. This is a very interesting idea. In fact, this is the most mathematical part of this story, even though Dupont does not explain the math behind this. This is the math of randomness. If I asked you to. If I if I gave you some dots. And I wanted you to put these dots on the board randomly how would you do it would you make sure would you like you know put one here put one there and then it looks like the dots are all over the place that's not random because when you try to make it look random it actually looks like it's more or less evenly spread out so a truly random arrangement will have places that do not look random. And it will have other places that look very random. Because random is not just about the arrangement, it's also about the rule of the arrangement. If you try to make it look random, then it's not random. Same here. D tries to make the letter look like not the letter that Dupont wants, but he tries so hard that it's very obvious. The difference is too different. So this is how Dupont discovers the letter. He thinks the letter must be near D at all times. He goes in and he finds the one letter that is too obvious. Isn't that very similar to how the letter was stolen? It's the one letter on the queen's table. It's right in front of her, but she's not looking at it. Minister D comes in, sees the situation and thinks, ah, it's obvious. Uh, and then um, Dupont goes on to tell us how he got the letter back. I think uh, Sherlock Holmes did something similar, tried to do something similar uh, in uh, a scandal in Bohemia, but there he failed. So what happens is Dupont goes to visit. In the middle of his visit, he had paid some people to create a noise outside. Minister D runs to the window to see what's going on. Uh, where's the word? Right, casement. Casement means window. So Minister D goes to the window, sees what's going on. In the meantime, Dupont stepped to the card rack, took the letter, put it in my pocket, and replaced it by a facsimile, which means identical fake letter, which I had carefully prepared at my lodgings where I sleep, imitating the D cipher very readily by means of a seal formed of bread. Oh, jeez. So 
he has prepared a fake letter and he takes this time to switch out the letters. Just like Minister D switched out the Queen's letter in order to steal it. Uh, in fact, uh, Dupont knows that he is copying D's methods. And so in the middle of the fake letter, he sends this message to Minister D. And we have a translation below. So baneful a scheme, if not worthy of Atreus, is worthy of Thiestes. And this is referring to a story, again, where one person uses the same plan as another person to take revenge on that person. Uh, and then one last point, which is at the very beginning of the story, we talked about this last week. Dupont says to the prefect of police three times, maybe the situation is too simple, too plain, too self-evident. And it turns out to be true. The letter was there all along. You didn't need to spend so much time and effort trying to find that letter. Moving on, question two. Uh, I guess at this point, Dupont knows that searching again will make no difference. So why does he ask G to search again? Well, think about how Dupont solves the case. The next time the police comes back, Dupont produces the letter for him. So everything we just talked about has already happened. But in order for Dupont to do this, he needs time. So maybe he's asking the police to search again so that he himself has time to steal the letter back. Now, why does he need this time? If the police are not searching Dee's home, what would they be doing? Yes, but like why? The police are not his enemy, right? Why does he need to stall the police? I think it's because maybe Dupont is afraid that the police will try to steal his method. If you think about if we go back to the story, as soon as he produces the letter, Prefect G grabs the letter and runs away. So the police still don't know how he got it back. Maybe Dupont is afraid that the police will steal his method. It's a professional knowledge, right? Business secret. Another possibility is maybe Dupont is afraid that while trying to steal his secret, the police might fuck up his investigation because in this story, the police are idiots. Right? If the police are so bad at thinking about what Minister D would do, maybe they might be equally bad at observing Dupont without intervening, without making a mistake. Maybe when they notice Dupont is sneaking into uh, maybe when uh, Dupont is arranging the noise outside, the police might step in to solve the situation, which would be terrible. All sorts of things. We can't trust idiots. So Dupont gives them something to do while he makes his own plans. I think that makes more sense. Okay, question three, the example of the schoolboy. A few groups took this question. Let's look at page 25. So in this story, Dupont uses many different ways to explain how he found the solution. Here, one of his explanations has to do with a schoolboy. I knew one, a schoolboy, about eight years of age, whose success at guessing in the game of even and odd, oh, shu ji shu, attracted universal admiration. So he's very good at this game. 
This game is simple and is played with marbles. Tantu. One player holds in his hand a number of these toys and demands of another whether that number is even or odd. If the guess is right, the guesser wins one. If wrong, he loses one. The boy to whom I allude, so the boy that I'm talking about, won all the marbles of the school. He's a really good player. Also, the other players are idiots. Like, like think about this. If you're the last person not to have lost to this guy out of the whole school, would you try to play him? No, I would be scared. I would run away. Uh, of course, he had some principle of guessing, and this lay in mere observation and admeasurement of the astuteness of his opponents. Astuteness just means like how smart the other person is. Uh, and then he gives an example. Um, and after the example, he asks, what is the principle? And the narrator says, it is an identification of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent. So you match how you think to how smart or stupid you think your opponent is. So if your opponent is an idiot, you think like an idiot. If he's very smart, you think like someone who's very smart. Does the question asks, does this example make sense? There are two parts to this question. Does the explanation of the way the boy wins the game make sense? And does this story make sense to help us understand the case? So the first part, uh, all the groups who took this question agree, the story itself does not make sense. Like, yes, it could be that a boy is very good at this game. And yes, it could be that he knows how to guess even and odd very well. But the conclusion that he wins by matching his intellect to the other does not make sense. A person is not just smart or stupid. Sometimes a smart person makes mistakes. Sometimes a stupid person gets lucky. So the question is not about intellect. The question is about empathy. Can you put yourself in the other player's position? Can you think like the other person? Uh, if you were in that position, how would you think? So it's not about intellect. Uh, of course, maybe this is a language problem. Maybe the word intellect means something different in the 19th century, but it's not exactly how we would explain this today. But the second part, both groups agree, makes sense. How did Dupont solve the case? He thought about how Minister D would think. And he thought about how Minister D would think about the police. And in that way, he realized that there's only one way Minister D would hide the letter by not hiding it. And in fact, this is also how Minister D stole the letter in the first place. He, he Minister D thought about how the queen would think in that situation. He knew that the queen could not say anything about the letter. So by understanding how his opponent thinks, he is able to steal the letter. And therefore, by understanding how D thinks, Dupont is also able to steal the letter back. So the connection with the case makes sense but the story's conclusion itself does not make a lot of sense. This tells us that maybe Edgar Allan Poe wrote the conclusion to the story and then tried to find some way to explain it. It also tells us that this story was published in a magazine and so he needed it. The, the longer the story was, the more money Poe could make. Number four, Poe pretends to have translated the story from French. So why are all of these French words still in the story? Nobody took this question, so it's my question. Well, one reason could be precisely because it is pretended to be from French. 
the reader knows that it's not really from French. This is already Alan Poe's third Dupont story. Everybody knows that he is the person who wrote them. Everybody knows that Dupont is not a real detective. So when Poe pretends to translate it from French, everybody knows that he is pretending to translate from French. It's not really from French. So in order to give this story a feeling of Frenchness, uh, I guess in French they would say Françoisie, he adds these French words to remind people that this is supposed to be in French. This is set in France. It makes the reader feel like it's more French, even though it's not very logical. Another possible reason could be that at the time, Paris was the cultural capital of the Western world. So using French words makes this story more literary. It gives it more culture. So instead of saying boredom, you say ennui. Instead of saying bedroom, you say boudoir and people will think that you have culture and taste. Um, the detective story at the time was a new thing, right? This is the third detective story in the world. Well, I mean, in the Western world. Apparently there were some in East Asia, um, but the third in the Western world, people were not sure exactly how to think about this kind of story. So it's a golden opportunity for Alan Poe to try to give it more significance, try to give it more culture. And one way to do this is by adding some French words at the time. Uh, and then one last reason could be some of these words make more sense in French than in English. The word ennui, today we still use this word in English. It's not just boredom. It's a profound existential life altering sense of boredom. So bored you don't know the meaning of life. Par excellence, it, we also still use this in English today. It doesn't just mean the best. It means the absolute best, the best of the best, the best in the world. So even though we can translate these words, they don't mean exactly the same thing in English. Uh, like again, escritoire. In English, we call this a writing desk. But if you know these two words, you know that they don't refer to the exact same kind of desk. If you say writing desk, it sounds like a small wooden thing and you sit there and maybe there's like a shelf on top and you sit and write. But if you say escritoire, it sounds like it's a big desk with multiple things and you can sit there all day and have tea while you write in your journal. It's a different kind of idea. So he's not just adding French words for fun, although I'm sure he had a lot of fun. Question five, do you think the solution makes sense? Why or why not? This question is asking, when Edgar Allan Poe wrote this story and gave it this conclusion, do you think that conclusion makes sense? Uh, one group took this question. They think it does make sense. The, the psychology behind this story makes sense. People do feel curious about things that are hidden. People do try to seek important things in hidden places. So it could be possible for somebody to hide something valuable in plain sight. And it could be possible for someone to steal that thing who knows about this strategy. Like I always say, if you want to get away with something, pretend like you're supposed to do it. Don't quote me, especially if you end up in jail. And number six, how can you tell the story was written in the antebellum period. Let's take a look at page two of the handout. Uh, let's think if there's anything here that matches what we have seen in the story. Let's see. 
economic instability, a worry about money. Like, yes, we're talking about the king and queen, but blackmail is about money. So it is uh, so still related to worrying about money. It's a bit weak, but I think it could work. Urbanization, the story takes place in the middle of a city. It would not make sense in the country or like on a farm. So in order for readers to understand the story, they must also be familiar with the idea of a city. So even if not everybody lives in a city, everybody knows about cities and knows how they work. Periodical culture, the story was published in a periodical, in a magazine. Let's see. Uh, the rise of publishing, steamships, canals, railroads, a bigger market for literature and publishing. Yes, this is true. Uh, remember, Alan Poe was a dead drunk. He was a gambler. He could not hold on to money to save himself, literally. And yet he could live off of his writing. Which means no matter how much he spent, he was still able to make enough or to borrow enough to go on living for many years. That must be a pretty big market for his writing. Let's see, 1844, Samuel Morse invents the telegraph, Dianbao. And then we also had what? Steamship, Zhenqi Chuan, Canal, Railroad. So we can say that there's lots of technology being invented in this era. So people are thinking, especially the telegraph, like this thing is a miracle. You, in, before you had to wait months for letters across the country. With the telegraph, it takes minutes. This completely changed the way that people communicated and thought about space and time and the world. So everybody in this period was thinking about technology and thinking about how these technologies work. So in the story, we have mentioned about mathematics. I pointed this out earlier. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, I, I, can, I can search. Ta da, page 27. No, 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 not 27. Uh, mm. Yes, okay. So, yes, page 27. They mentioned mathematics. Um, there was a mention of algebra, right? Ah, mathematical axioms. And then form and quantity. Science, chemistry, right? Chemistry, Hwashri, mathematical truth, uh, finite truth, Yoshin Zendi. And then there was a mention of like algebra, right? Tai Shu. Analysis, Fen Shi Shu Shi. So, like, all of these ideas appear in the story. These very technical scientific ideas. And even if the reader does not understand these ideas, the reader is aware that they exist or they have a certain value or attitude towards science and technology that makes this story more appealing. In an era where science is not the most important or interesting thing, maybe uh, the solution would only depend on psychology. The explanation would only depend on psychology and like human nature or like virtue and vice, right? San -e. But here, one part of the explanation is about math and chemistry. So this is also connected with the technological inventions of this period. Yeah, I think that's about it. Those are the most important connections. OK, so for these six questions, do you have anything to ask or do you want me to repeat anything? OK, next week. 
please read another short story. By a dude named Jack London, you might have heard of his name before. He is the author of a few famous novels such as The Call of the Wild. White Fang. Stories about wolves and humans in Alaska, basically. Oh wait, no, sorry, there's two weeks later. Uh, next week we're reading about slavery. Sorry about that. So page 32 to 34, 5. Yes, 32 to 35. Very simple. So what are we reading? We're going to be reading two speeches. One speech is by somebody I am sure you know. Abraham Lincoln, 16th president of the United States, winner of the Civil War, killed soon after by a gunman who shot him from the back of the head. There was a movie about him a few years ago by Steven Spielberg. I think it was in 2012 or something. This is Lincoln's most famous speech. It is famous because it is good, but also because it is short. This is the entire speech. This is not a selection. This is the entire speech. Uh, so what is this speech about? It's called Address Delivered at the Dedication of the Cemetery at Gettysburg, November 19, 1863. Gettysburg, is a place in Pennsylvania, I think. It is a battlefield. It is the bloodiest day of the civil or three days of the Civil War. And the most ironic thing is it is of absolutely no importance. This place is not important at all. It just happens that one army was there and so the other army attacked and lots of people died. Uh, it, it's the most famous battle in the Civil War, partly because Abraham Lincoln gave this speech afterwards. Uh, this battle was won by the North. So even though the place is not important, the battle itself is important because the South lost so many men here that it was hard to fight back after this battle. Uh, it's very important for people in the American South also because so many of their military heroes fucked up during this battle. If you read a history of this battle, it's just one mistake after another. It's really in, uh, fascinating. Uh, I could talk about this battle all day, but like I'm thinking about what to say that you have to know. So for example, uh, today this is now a national historic park to commemorate the battle. Soon after the Civil War ended, there was an effort to reintegrate the South into the country. One way they did this is by welcoming Southern veterans, Rongming, and soldiers, people who used to support the Southern rebel government and to welcome them back into the country. And one way they did this is through the culture. So here at Gettysburg, you will see a dedication to the Northern soldiers, but you will also see a dedication to the Southern soldiers. Again, the Southern soldiers who were rebels against the government and they lost the war. There is a dedication to them here. And in fact, there's also a joint dedication to both North and South. And this is a symbol of how uh, the ideas supported by the South really did not go away. Ideas like uh, racism and the individual rights of states still exist in American politics and culture because of how they dealt with these ideas after the war. And you can see that in the memorials at Gettysburg. Um, And you can even see this here in this speech. Lincoln does not say Northern soldiers or Southern soldiers. He talks about all the soldiers who died. 
Uh, another interesting thing about this speech, if we have time, we have time. OK, so Lincoln had prepared a longer speech. And because he was the president, he was not the first person to give a speech, right? If you're like a headline, if you're Taylor Swift and you give a concert, Taylor Swift does not simply walk out on stage, right? There are people who perform before Taylor Swift to get the crowd prepared and excited. Same thing for Lincoln. He was the Taylor Swift of his time. There was also a famous local politician who gave a speech before Lincoln. The speech was really, really long. And Lincoln, you know, he had prepared a, a brief speech. But the more he listened to this first speech, the more he thought, you know, what's the use of saying so much? The idea I want to say is so simple. We cannot forget the dead soldiers who died here. We, for their sake, we have to work for a better government. I don't need that many words. So he took his already short speech. And instead of reading all of it, he read parts of it. Now, because he decided to do this on the day, we don't actually have a record of the exact speech that he gave. We have reports from different newspapers of reporters who wrote down what they heard. We also have Lincoln's original draft, which was a bit longer. And we have this. After the speech became famous, somebody, I think Library of Congress, asked Lincoln to give them a copy of the speech. But of course, there is no copy. So Lincoln, working from memory and from those newspaper reports, tried to write the speech again, to reproduce the speech. So, and this is the official version. So this is not exactly what Lincoln said, but it's very close. And it's what Lincoln approved of afterwards. So as I said, the main idea, so many soldiers died. For their sake, we have to work for a better government. The second speech is longer, so we're only going to read an extract, a selection. This is by Frederick Douglass. This guy, Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a slave who ran away. All his life, or most of his life, he was illegal. Near the end of his life, some friends paid off his uh, master, and he became actually free. But for most of his life, he was always on the run. He had to be, a, uh, to be wary of slave catchers and people who supported slavery trying to catch him and return him back to the South. So he spent a lot of his life in Europe, and, mo and almost all of the rest of his life in the north of the country. On this day, July 5, 1852, he was invited to Rochester, New York by a group of uh, abolitionist women. So a lot of social movements at the time were led by women. These women opposed slavery, 1852. Civil War was 1861 to 65. So this is before the Civil War. These women opposed slavery, and at the time, the best way to spread information and to learn new things is by attending a speech. This was before radio, before television. Speeches were the biggest form of mass entertainment and education. So on this day, these women invited the most famous anti-slavery speaker to give them a speech, Frederick Douglass. And what did Douglass decide to talk about? What to the slave is the 4th of July? 4th of July is the American Independence Day. So for the average American, it's a great day. But what about to the slave? What to the slave is the 4th of July? This speech is famous because Douglas insults those women. His, the basic message of this speech is, how dare you invite a slave to help you celebrate your Independence Day when none of us are free? And that's basically the main idea of the speech.
Uh, and then uh, the most famous part of this speech is uh, near the end of this selection. And the basic idea of this very famous part is you ask me to give you a speech to give you reasons and arguments against slavery. But everybody knows that slavery is wrong. Southerners don't own slaves because they think it's right. They own slaves because they want to make money. So here. Uh, it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind and the earthquake. In other words, arguments will do nothing. Everybody already agrees. What we need is power. What we need is to shake people up and make them admit and see in their own lives how wrong and evil slavery is. And this, of course, is against the principle of giving speeches, right? You you go to a speech to have fun and also to learn something. Anybody who supports slavery, who sees, oh, there's a speech by Frederick Douglass, will not have their minds changed simply because this black person gives a speech against slavery. Something bigger must happen. And of course, something bigger did happen. It's called the Civil War. So for next week, please read these two speeches. Uh, think about the different perspectives that are presented here about the idea of the nation, the idea of America and freedom and the values that Americans say that they support. And we'll talk about these next week. Questions? OK, that's it for today. Uh, remember to come sign in. I have one extra copy of the handout if you want it. <laughs>